Excuse me. Okay, we're going to look at the complex inner products. Now, the complex inner product has most of the properties of just regular old inner products, with the exception of this characteristic. Okay? The inner product of W and V, where V and W are uh, vectors in your complex space, is the conjugate of the product of VW. In other words, you have something like conjugate symmetry in the uh, inner product. Okay, If you reverse the order, or conjugate commutivity if you wish, uh, if you reverse the order of W and V here, you get the complex conjugate. Example, <clears throat> if VW equals just plain old V dot W, where we use the dot product to indicate the product that we would have if we use the same rule that we use for the dot product with vectors in real spaces. Uh, and just a vector uh, in, in two, to, two complex dimensions. If uh, V is A1 plus B1I, uh, A2 plus B2I, and W is C1 plus D1I plus C2 plus D2I, then the inner product uh, is going to be V dot W, okay? And that's going to be the V vector times the conjugate of the W vector. So we have conjugates here, meaning that this vector is going to be equal to this. The imaginary parts are going to change sign. The v vector stays the same. Well, we just do what we think of as a standard dot product. This times this, this times this, <coughs> and it's clear what we get. We have it here. Okay, this times this is the, uh, plus this times this. Well, there it is. W dot v is going to be the w vector, same thing we have here, plus the conjugate of the v vector. And that's going to work out like this. The v vector will now be the one that has the negatives on the i components. And here's our product. Now we could expand the product and so forth. Um, and you should do that. But we can verify that this is the complex conjugate of this. Because all the real parts of this product are going to be the same down here. <clears throat> and all the imaginary parts of the product will be of opposite side down here. Specifically, we have B1I times C1, just for an example. And down here, what do we have? Well, we have a negative B1I here and a C1 here, so we're going to have a negative B1I times C1. A positive B1I times C1 here, a negative B1I times C1 down here. Okay, well, the same with A1, D1 times I. It's A1 times negative D1 times I here. And down here, the D1 times I is multiplied by A1, giving us a positive D1 I times A1. Again, the imaginary part has the opposite sign. You can see the same two thing for B2 and C2. That would be here and here. And for A2 and D2, here. Those are all I components, and that's all of the I components. So they're all of opposite sign here is here. Well, that's half of what you need for this to be conjugate, complex conjugate of this. The real parts also have to be equal in this case. So you have a restriction on the real parts that have to be equal. Well, we see that we're going to have an A1C1 and A2C2. Uh, we have an A1C1 and an A2C2 here, and that takes care of almost all of the real parts. Except we also have B1, D1, I squared, and it's a negative B1, D1, I squared, and a negative B2, D2, I squared. Okay, so what do we have on I squared down here? Um, well, here we have a negative B1, D1 
times i squared, just as we have up here. So that's going to match. And a negative b2 d2 times i squared here as well as here, that's going to match. And of course the i squared is negative 1, and that's going to make this into a real number. And you can work out all the rest of the details. I do recommend that you go ahead and expand this and simplify it and convince yourself, but also convince yourself that just by looking at the structure of the sum of these products and uh, so the structure of these products, uh, you can verify it uh, very well without writing it out. And what I say is you can easily convince yourself that it's so. If you want to convince somebody else, you're going to have to write it out. Okay. Uh, either that or talk to them. Okay, another example of a complex inner product. On a space of complex valued functions of real variable x, if we, uh, well, what, what do we mean by a complex valued function of a real variable x? Well, x is a real number. Okay, so x is a real number, and f of x is going to be complex valued, meaning it's going to have a real part that's a function of x and an imaginary part that's a function of x. And we'll uh, designate the real and imaginary parts as f1 of x and f2 of x. If you let the inner product of f and g, and there are some restrictions on f and g, you know, they have to at least be integral and so forth. The product has to be integral uh, on the interval 0 and 1. So, you know, a bunch of technical but important details that you want to be very aware of. In any case, if we use the integral from 0 to 1 as the inner product, we're going to do this in a way analogous to the way we did that. We're going to say that it's the inner product of f and g is going to be the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x times the conjugate of g, complex conjugate of g, with respect to x. So the gf, well, the second function in the pair is going to be a complex conjugate over here. <coughs> the second function of the pair here is f, so you're going to have the conjugate of f times g times uh, integrated with respect to x. Okay? We can verify that, uh, again, we have the anti-symmetry, the anti-symmetry that we have to have in order to have a complex inner product. Now, we haven't discussed why the complex inner product has to be that way. We'll see that in a minute. Uh, but there's a very good reason for it. It's not just something that somebody made up. It's something that works without which you wouldn't have a Euclidean space here. Okay. Um, so, anyhow, uh, writing it out in terms of the F1 and F2 and G1 and G2, real and imaginary parts of F and of G, we have then this integral becomes this, g conjugate. Conjugate should have been a little closer here. You can't tell if it's underline up here or a bar over the g1 plus g2, but it's the latter. The bar is over this. Uh, that, that, that means the g1 plus g2i is going to become g1 minus g2i. Now, I should back up something I should have specified earlier. Uh, it should be implicitly understood, but... Uh, that f1 of x and f2 of x are real valued functions, giving us then the complex value function f of x. Okay, so since g1 and g2 are real valued, uh, the values of g1 of x and g2 of x will be real numbers, and the complex conjugate uh, of g1 plus g2i will then be g1 minus g2i. And then uh, for the gf, your conjugate is going to be on the f1 plus f2i, giving you f1 minus f2i. Um, then when we multiply these out, we can make comparisons similar to the ones we did over here. Uh, and we see that the real part being, in this case, f1 g1 plus f2 g2 is going to be the same here as it is here. You're going to have an f1 g1 plus an F2 G2. That's plus because you have a minus F2 G2 I squared, which is a plus F2 G2. Uh, so, your real part in both cases 
is the integral of the F2 G2 product. The imaginary part, you can see how that matches up. You have a negative G1 F2 here. Um, I'm sorry, you have a G1 F2 here and a negative G1 F2 here. You have a G2 F2, sorry, you have a G2 F1 here, imaginary part, and sorry, you have a negative G2 F1 here for your imaginary part, and a G2 F1 for your imaginary part here. In each case, the complex coefficients are equal and opposite coefficients of i. So that fg is equal to the conjugate of gf, complex conjugate. Now we want to maybe think a little bit about why we want, hmm, well we do want to think about why, oh yeah, okay, it's over here, sorry. Okay. Why is it that you have complex conjugates? Why uv equals vu bar. Why the bar? That should have been a little higher to make it a bar, but hopefully you understand. That's because, as with real inner products, we want to define the magnitude or the norm of a vector to be the square root of the inner product of the vector with itself. Okay. Uh, then we have essentially Euclidean metric. Uh, just as the norm of the column vector AB would be the square root of the dot product of AB with itself, and that square root, well, the product of AB with itself is just A times A plus B times B, A squared plus B squared, so that the magnitude of the inner product is the square root of a squared plus b squared. Now if you think about the complex representation of a number, okay, you have a real axis, and no way you can read that, I can't even read it. You have a real axis with your real number a, imaginary axis with your uh, coefficient of your imaginary, well, coefficient of i being b, this vector represents a plus b i. What's the length of that vector? Well, that vector is the hypotenuse of a triangle with legs a and b. The magnitude of the vector is a squared plus b squared. That's exactly what you get for real values of a and b here. Okay? If z equals a plus b i, and actually it's really a z that I depicted here, then the magnitude of z is the square root of a squared plus b squared both of these by the Pythagorean theorem. But if you define, oh, if your inner product um, involves complex numbers, you're going to want things to work out something like this. Okay, the inner product of just a, a, a one-dimensional vector, a plus bi with itself, is going to be, it's not going to be a plus bi dot a plus bi, or times a plus bi, uh, well, make that a dot. Um, it's going to be a plus bi times a complex conjugate to show that it has to be that way. Uh, this would then be a plus bi times a minus bi. Okay? And if you expand that, you get a squared minus b squared i squared. And these two terms are equal and opposite, so they add up to zero. So you get a squared minus b squared i squared, but of course i squared is 1, ne negative 1, so negative b squared i squared is plus b squared, and this product is a squared plus b squared. 
if we didn't have the complex conjugate thing here, it would be a mess. It wouldn't even be a squared minus b squared. Uh, and actually, I asserted down here that it would be. So let me fix that. Now the no good is going to remain. It's going to be a squared minus b squared minus two a b i. Not even real. And we do want, for a lot of reasons, a real inner product. It wouldn't even involve a squared plus b squared. Okay? So uh, that would be totally non-workable. We wouldn't have a consistent vector space. Uh, or at least not a consistent inner product space. There'd be other, other inconsistencies in the inner product if we did that. Okay? Got to do this. Okay, there are other deeper reasons, but... That alone is a very good reason. Okay. Now let me check the time in this video. Okay, I think we're good. Okay. Another thing we can do now is we, if, since we have an inner product space, we can talk about linear independence within that space. We talk about basis within that space. Well, just to demonstrate linear independence, let's take this set, just two vectors and uh, C2. Okay, now what do I mean by C2? I mean two-dimensional complex Euclidean space. A set of vectors of the form C1, Z2, where Z1 and Z2 are complex numbers with real and imaginary coefficients. Okay, well, clearly that's what we have here. We have a two-dimensional complex vector and another. Okay, S is linearly independent if the only way C1 times the first vector plus C2 times the second vector is equal to zero is if C1 and C2 are both zero. In other words, the only possible linear combination of these two vectors, which is these two, could be the only possible linear combination that could be zero is the trivial linear combination where C1 and C2 are both zero. Okay, well, so here's your arbitrary linear combination and here's the zero vector. This equation translates easily to a system of two linear equations. The system of two linear equations um, is easily solved. Um, so to, to solve it, uh, we want to eliminate C2 because this term looks like it's just going to be easier to eliminate than this term. Okay. To eliminate C2, we want C2i to equal negative 2C2, because if we multiply by some number, we want to find a multiple of C2i that's equal to negative 2C2, so that when we add the two, our unknown C2 goes away. So we want to find the number to multiply by C2 to get, to multiply by 2C2i to get 2C2, meaning we want to find a number to multiply by i in order to get 2. What do we multiply by i to get 2? Well, we do a little trial and error just to get an idea. We say, oh, let's try multiplying it by negative 2. Okay, well, if we multiply by negative 2, if we multiply i by negative 2i, okay, I'm sorry. Let's multiply it by negative 2i. What multiple of i would be equal to negative 2? Try negative 2. The negative 2 multiple of i. Negative 2i times i. But that gives you 2. 
Okay, so negative 2i isn't right, but we get 2. How would we get negative 2? Well, multiply it by the negative of what we just tried. So, trial and error isn't always the best way to do this, but right now we're going to just let it work. Uh, uh, so, we try 2i plus 2i times i, and sure enough, that's negative 2. This means that if we multiply this whole equation by negative 2i, the two equations are going to match up in such a way that when we add them, the C2 terms will add up to zero, and we'll end up with an equation in only C1. They're still going to have to do complex arithmetic, but we can handle that. Okay, so we multiply the first equation by 2i. Uh, here we have a 2i times the first uh, term plus 2i times the second term. Uh, and you see that it's going to give us this. I don't have to read it to you. You just distribute the 2i through this. Um, and then you do the arithmetic and you get this. So here is the first equation multiplied by 2i. And sure enough, we've got the negative 2c2. So now the system is what? Uh, c1 times negative 2 plus 2i that we get here. We'll play 2i by 1 plus i and the negative 2c2, which is what we were after. And then we have the second equation. If we add them, we get this. This is the sum of our two equations then. Okay, now, I just added this and this. I didn't try to simplify it. Uh, but if you simplify it, I mean, it's very simple. You got a negative 2 plus 1, which is negative 1. And you got a 2i minus i, which is just i. You got zero here, so you got c1 times negative i plus 1 equals zero. And now you divide both sides by negative 1 plus i. I think maybe said a negative i plus 1 a minute ago, but you see what it is. And you get c1 is zero over 1, negative 1 plus i. And of course, zero divided by any non zero number, real or complex, gives you zero. Okay, so c1 is zero. Now we Take this and plug it back in for C1 in the first equation. So the first equation becomes this. 0 times your negative 2 plus 2i. And then minus your 2C2 equals 0. Minus 2C2 equals 0. So that C2 is 0 over negative 2. But clearly that's 0. So I didn't bother with that intermediate step. <coughs> Thus it follows that... This linear combination, the one we have over here, can be equal to 0, 0 if and only if C1 equals C2 equals 0. Now we already know that if C1 and C2 are 0, you're going to get the 0 vector. Um, but this says only if the C1 and C2 are 0. Follows that the vectors, <coughs> excuse me, something down here. Now it follows that two vectors are linearly independent. Okay, now we can ask, and I, we don't have time to answer the question. We ran 15 minutes over, and I would have run over a little more and completed some of this, uh, but there was a, a, a retirement, a Zoom retirement celebration, uh, and yeah, we all wanted to be there. Uh, An alternative expression of our test for linear independence. Okay, now remember our test for linear independence. Well, maybe we better just keep this down here for a minute. Was well, this? We got these two equations. Now, these two equations, uh, just as for real vector spaces, can be expressed as a matrix equation, and you can easily verify that this matrix equation is totally equivalent to this. It is a test of this condition. So, an alternative test of the linear independence of this set of vectors that we've been working on all along is this matrix equation. If the matrix is invertible, then we can multiply both sides by the inverse, and we're used to doing that, so we see that C1, C2 is going to be equal to the inverse matrix multiplied by the zero vector. And of course, anything, any 
matrix multiplied by the zero vector is going to give you the zero vector. Okay? If the matrix is vertible, then C1, C2 equals this, and that's equal to 0, 0, so that C1 and C2 are again 0, and we've established linear independence once more. Well, let's check and see if this matrix is invertible. We can use a determinant, just like we do with real vector spaces, and I haven't proven that, uh, even to myself right now, but you can. Uh, it's very easy to prove. Uh, in, in any case, this determinant or disprove in case I'm wrong, right? Uh, this determinant is just this times this minus this times this. This minus this. You can see that very easily. Very simple determinant. And that's what? Uh, distributing here, I'm going to get again something ridiculous because I did distribute to 2. And then I said I minus I was zero. Well, okay, it's two plus two I minus I plus I squared. Okay, well, two I minus I isn't zero. Um, so that's a little clumsy. I'm going to put the I first. So two I minus I is I. And we have here then 2 plus i squared. i squared is minus 1, so that's 2 minus 1. And that's 1 plus i. And that's not equal to 0, obviously. So the matrix is invertible. So we don't have to do any more. We conclude that this set is linearly independent. We have another set of vectors, a set of three vectors and three space or something, or four space. Um, we can apply the same test. We can't do it in four space. It'd be four vectors and four unknowns. Um, but when you have, when the number of vectors is equal to the dimension of the vectors, uh, you're always going to get a square matrix here, and you can always test this by the inverse. And you can equally well test it by doing row reduction. Everything you can do for real space in this in testing for linear independence. You just do it for your complex space. Now, we're going to use the same matrix that I had here, but I'm not going on with the linear independence or invertibility, just talking about something different, okay? So, does this matrix have eigenvalues? Are there eigenvectors for this transformation. Uh, those eigenvectors would be uh, well, I don't even want to talk about that geometrically. I uh, can get into four-dimensional interpretations and stuff. Uh, and we're not going to touch that. Okay, so does this have eigenvalues? And therefore, probably eigenvectors. Turns out there's a little bit of a twist to this calculation. But the procedure is identical. Uh, you want the determinant of a minus lambda i uh, to equal zero. Okay, and for all the reasons that we used that condition previously. Um, so the determinant that then that would equal the determinant of well your your a matrix minus your lambda i matrix, which will have a minus lambda on each diagonal and zeros elsewhere. Well, when you write this out, this is what you get. And you do the determinant of this. And uh, you just work it out. And if I worked it out correctly and did all the steps, I'm not going to point to every step. It's just complex arithmetic. You just keep your wits about you and do what it says. Uh, anyhow, I think that this, if I did it correctly, simplifies to lambda squared minus lambda times 1 plus i plus quantity 1 plus i equals 0. <coughs> a quadratic equation in lambda, but with complex coefficients. Well, that's no big deal. The complex coefficient is 1 plus i here, negative 1 plus i. That's your, okay, your, your, your b is your one, negative 1 plus i. Your c is your 1 plus i. 
then you have 1 plus i plus or minus the square root of, okay, well, that, this is your negative b is going to be 1 plus i. b squared is going to be quantity 1 plus i squared. Um, and then minus 4ac, a is 1, c is 1 plus i. You have this. But you square this, you get 1 plus 2i plus i squared. And then minus 4 minus 4i distributing here. I squared is negative 1, you got 1 here, so your negative 1 goes away. You're left with a negative 4 for your real number, and a plus 2i minus 4i, which is negative 2i for your imaginary number, and there you have it. Now all you have to do is find the square root of negative 4 minus 2i. How are you going to do that? You're going to use the Mavra's theorem. Okay? Um, and this vector if sketched on a coordinate system where you got real here, imaginary axis here, is going to be minus 4 and then minus 2i going to be here. Its magnitude yeah, I said it was a fourth root and um, well the magnitude of negative 4 minus 2i is 20 so the magnitude of this vector, I'll write it kind of like it's a length is 20 and its magnitude Got too many square roots in there. It's just a square root of 20. The angle I said is an arc tangent of one half. Well, your y here is negative two, negative two. Your x is negative four. So the tangent of this angle here is one half. Um, this angle is therefore one hundred and eighty degrees plus the arc tangent of one half. Yeah, of course, you've got to be up in your trigonometry, but that's just very basic. One half the arctangent, one half plus 180 degrees. Once you have this angle, you can find its cosine, you can find its sine, and you can multiply its cosine and its sine by the square root of 20 and get the square root. And it's going to be half the angle and the square root of its magnitude. 